The program will begin shortly. Please welcome to the stage Dan Porterfield and Mayor Dan Gelber. So first of all, uh, let's just hear it for uh, Corral Morphologic. That was an incredible presentation just now. Thank you very much. So I'm Dan Gelber, and it is my privilege to be the mayor of this city. Uh, and I can uh, tell you uh, that I'm very proud to be able to say welcome to the inaugural and annual Aspen Ideas Climate in Miami Beach. Thank you. Um, so this sort of came about 30 years ago. I, w I, used I was living in Washington and playing basketball uh, with this gentleman here. Uh, Dan Porterfield, who is the CEO and president of the Aspen Institute. He wasn't back then. He was simply a guy who was a very good passer, and I was a very enthusiastic shooter. <laughs> and so we became friends, and when he ascended to his current job, and I became the mayor of the city, uh, last year we said, what could we do together? And he had a very easy idea. Uh, he said, let's have a Ideas Fest climate in your city. And it made total sense to me, because frankly, Aspen, has on its website what its goal is, which is the very understated, <laughs> modest goal of solving the greatest problems facing the world today. Uh, that's what they aim to do. And my city has that problem right here. Uh, and we are, I think, uh, if you think about it, we are a uh, barrier island, man-made, built on porous limestone, sitting at sea level. So we advise our residents when there is king tides, and we have been dealing with sunny day flooding and climate change and, and, and rising waters on a regular basis. Uh, we are in many ways uh, the canary in the mine shaft in this issue, uh, and it's great to have a canary in the mine shaft, unless of course you're the canary, and which of course you have this. So we were in incredibly excited to have Aspen come here because to a great extent, 
we are a pretty good microcosm of what every city and, and community in the world is facing. How do we deal with this issue? How do we track a solution? And from my judgment, I think the technology, uh, the engineering solutions are there. It's just political will. But to have a moment when we can all come together, the greatest minds, the most Im important thinkers, the people who can move things, and the people who need to listen and be part of the conversation in one place at one time every year is going to help that. So it is really my great honor to have Aspen here. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce my friend and the, great, the greatest passer I've ever worked with, uh, the CEO and President of the Aspen Institute, Dan Porterfield. Well, he's not just uh, a shooter, he's a scorer. And he's not just a scorer, he's a great coach and a great leader. Thank you, Dan, so much. And thank you to your team, led by the spectacular Michelle Berger. And of course, thank you to all who are associated with this gorgeous facility and the other facilities that we're using for this summit, all those who put this together, who are preparing all the different sessions, all the ways that we get to enjoy the best possible accommodation. So thank you to the staff here. So I bring you greetings from the Aspen Institute's board chair, Jim Crown, and with great gratitude to Mayor Daniela uh, Levine Cava from Miami-Dade County, to Mayor Francis Suarez from the City of Miami, to the Aspen Institute teams that have worked passionately for months on end, even through a COVID delay. Greg Gershani, Kitty Boone, Elliot Gerson, please join me in thanking my colleagues for all of their hard work. And thank you to our visionary sponsors who have really turned out. Uh, in the M greater Miami area, especially our title partners, the Knight Foundation, Related Group, the Jorge M. Perez Family Foundation, Stuart Miller, the Lenar Foundation, Amazon, and our Aspen Institute trustee, Antonio Gracias and Valor. Thank them all for making this possible. <laughs> and finally, let me thank all of you for taking part. We all know that the climate crisis is real, is sizable, and is solvable. We also know that we still have time if we put our hearts, our minds, and our bodies in motion to save lives, to save places, to save cultures, to save species, to save habitats, to save the future. We still have time. The Aspen Institute is a global nonprofit that works for a free, just, and equitable society. One way we do so is by assembling diverse and sincere people, like all of you here today, for open, smart, informed, and civil convenings that lead to learning and lead to progress. Aspen Ideas Climate reflects this approach. It is a firmly fact-based and solutions-oriented convening, highlighting research, community wisdom, energy technologies, smart investment, innovations across the board, from food to construction to shipping to transportation to coastal protection to indigenous community actions to public messaging and more. Climate issues are complex and multifaceted, and no one has a monopoly on truth. That is why we encourage all of you to attend sessions on topics that you may know absolutely nothing about so that we can all come away and go back to our communities, our workplaces, our homes, uh, to get the job done with new ideas. And I, for one, know I have a great deal to learn from this convening. Now, Aspen Ideas Climate is part of the Aspen Institute's larger strategy for engagement in the greater Miami community. We're really raising our flags here. We're helping to create ecosystems of support for Latino small-led businesses, we're investing in local high school students and schools, some of whom are taking part in the summit. We're launching a major leadership program for first-generation college goers here in Miami. We're working with anchor institutions like Miami-Dade College, which won the 2018 Aspen Prize as the best community college in the country, 
and we're working closely with the University of Miami and FIU, active in our American Talent Initiative. So we're also so proud to be hosting Aspen Ideas Climate annually, or at least for the next two years. <laughs> what an honor. This region is a multicultural mecca and a beacon of excellence. It's an opportunity crossroads. We love it here. Thank you so much for welcoming us to be a part of the community. Now, as we open this convening, and as we expand our partnerships, especially with the young in Miami, I'd like to express for a moment a particular commitment of the Aspen Institute, given recent events here and elsewhere that have sparked concerns among LGBT communities, families, and allies. That commitment that we make is to human dignity, which all humans have equally, and the support of which led to the founding of the Aspen Institute seven decades ago. As a result, in our work here in this region and everywhere, all children, all youth, all families, all colleagues will be treated equitably and affirmatively. We stand with the LGBTQ community, and we are so pleased that members of the community are taking part in this summit right here. Thank you all so much for that. And in that spirit of inclusion and love, I encourage all here today to speak freely. Bring your full selves to the breakout discussions and the informal conversations. That's what Aspen Institute convenings are all about. Everyone is wanted, everyone is valued, and everyone has something beautiful to contribute. Thank you. Let me now turn it back to the big guy. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dan, and thank you so much. Listen, over the next hour, you're going to hear uh, some extraordinary speakers. First, NBC Today's Al Roker is going to share his thoughts on this historic moment uh, that's going on right now. John Doerr is going to give a blueprint for getting to net zero. And the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, is in the House, and she's going to outline Congress's climate priorities. So first of all, and finally, thank you. Uh, for joining us for this very important and informative uh, week. And now I'd like to welcome Cheyenne Kippenberger from the Aspen Institute's Center for Native American Youth for a Land Acknowledgement. Thank you all. Have a great night. Chihintamo. <laughs> Chahochevke Cheyenne Kotham, Yaketeshe Chahochevke Ithotham, Anyathate Kuwa Thotham, Samano Kotomle, Joseph Kippenberger Kun, Oshte Kotomle, Susan Kippenberger Kun, Omwashotam, Lawana Asiola Kun, Ombushotam. Hi everyone, my name is Cheyenne Ithet Kippenberger. My English name Cheyenne was given to me by my mother, my traditional name Ithet given to me by my paternal grandmother, the matriarch of my family. I am the daughter of Joe and Dr. Susan Kippenberger, the granddaughter of Lawana Osceola, and I proudly work for the Center for Native American Youth at the Aspen Institute. I am a citizen of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. I was born here in beautiful Florida, and just as my family has for generations, I've lived my life surrounded by beaches, swamps, and oak trees. But as I've grown older, the lands have changed. The shorelines of the beach have gone closer to the boardwalk. There's less and less oak trees that surround me, and the Everglades is neglected. Everything I saw as a little girl is gone. The wide open spaces turn to shopping malls, the cow pastures into apartment complexes, and the creek we played and bathed in as kids is poisoned and polluted. I think of the pain that makes me feel, but then I think of my grandmother and her grandmother's pain and what that makes them feel to see their homelands be abused, destroyed, and poisoned. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who have contributed their hopes, dreams, 
prayers, and energy to making history that led us here to this very moment. May we recognize that some were brought against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in search of a better life. And some have lived on this land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are the foundation to healing and transformation. We begin this effort today by acknowledging that we are in the ancestral lands of native nations, including the Taino, the Calusa, the Tequesta, and today, the sovereign and unceded homelands of the Seminole Tribe of Florida and the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. Our communities and ways have existed long before the United States. We have survived attempted takeovers, the Indian Removal Act under Andrew Jackson, three seminal wars between 1814 and 1858, being hunted with bloodhounds, rounded up like cattle, and forced on the Trail of Tears, foreign disease, and racial hatred and violence in a place that only alligators, snakes, and mosquitoes can survive. We hid in a place that we knew, loved, and respected, and in turn, she respected us and helped us hide. We lived in our traditional camps of Chiquis, isolated from Florida society and the rest of the world well into the late 1920s. As developments like the Tamiami Highway reached the edge of our salvation, we began to interact and open up to new world concepts. Today, we are the unconquered Seminole Tribe of Florida and the proud Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. Despite forced removal and relocation, we are reminded of our presence in Florida every day through our native words and names throughout the state, on street signs, national parks, and more. Please recognize that people were forcibly moved from the land beneath us. As a means for survival, they abandoned everything they knew, their way of life, and the land that they loved. And you should too. Recognize the legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and colonial settlement that brings us here. To genuinely acknowledge the land, we must also go and connect with the land. Everything holds life. The soil, the animals, the plants, the trees. We are all in connection. And just as our bodies remember love or violence, those living beings remember the ways in which they were once treated and held sacred. Feel the cold dirt beneath your feet. Thank the sun for rising before you this morning. Appreciate the wind kissing your face in the afternoon. Let us commit to going beyond performative land acknowledgements at the beginning of conferences by connecting with each other and our earth in a healing, transformative way. May we be clear that acknowledging stolen land and acknowledging cultural erasure is not progress. True progress is defined in empowering indigenous people, supporting rematriation of the land, and ensuring that real, accurate histories are being taught in educational institutions across the country. Empowering indigenous people is also working to establish a more equitable and inclusive society dismantling systemic racism and combating violence and erasure. And this is a reminder that no matter where you are in this country or in the world, you are on indigenous land. As you carry on this week through this conference, I ask you to reflect on your walking tours, in your breakout sessions, at your roundtable discussions, reflect on the land that you occupy and the benefits you enjoy from colonization. Reflect on what this land used to look like. Reflect on the lands that called this home for thousands of years, and reflect on your impact on settler colonization. And when you have your conversations about climate solutions and preservation, ask yourself, where are the indigenous voices and perspectives? Indigenous people are, and always have been, the stewards of these lands for time and memorial. Respect and value our practices and knowledge, and remember that it will take all of us to protect these lands for future generations. I welcome you to my homelands, 
Thank you, Shana Bashat and Mado. Please welcome Al Roker. Wow, well, after that, I think I'm just going to go home. Because I can't top that. Uh, that gives us uh, something to think about as we uh, go forward in this. And uh, I'm, I'm just really honored to be here and humbled. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm, uh, I'm uh, on the Today Show in the morning. It's on NBC, seen on NBC6 here in New York. Thanks so much for that tepid response. That was uh, really <laughs> underwhelming. Uh, but we're hoping that things pick up as we go. But don't worry, it's only seven minutes, so you, you won't have time for your butt to go numb. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. When I first started, you know, when somebody says it's interesting, it rarely is. It's like when they say, you know, it's funny. And if I have to tell you it's funny, it's not. But uh, I've, I started doing television weather in 1974. Most of you weren't born in 1974, but when we started doing television weather, uh, it was usually at the end of the newscast. There was a black and white loop of a satellite picture, and that was about it. Uh, but the fact is that the segment, the television weather segment, on both local news and network news, has become something more. Uh, technology has allowed us to bring more information to you much more quickly. Oh, wow, there are people up in the balcony. That's nice. Hi, how are you? I'm going to do a disappearing dime trick for you a little later. Um, but you know, the, the idea that our weather has become much more, that we're looking at it in a much bigger picture. Everybody is talking about the climate. What is our climate? How does it affect us? How does it make our lives better or worse? Well, the fact is, we have to tell people, our job in the mornings and for your local weather people in the afternoons and evenings, we give you a forecast. But now it's more than that, because our weather is being affected by the climate. Many times they were thought separately, but now they are one and the same. Uh, for example, I'm from New York City, but one of the things New York City and Miami have in common, sea level rise. Uh, both cities, in the next 40 years, we'll have to spend about $4 billion to raise roads, to change drainage systems, to put in more pumps, to put in more seawalls, to protect from a rising sea level. Why? Because as our planet warms, our ice caps are melting and our sea levels are rising. Uh, at the NBC News Climate Unit, we have gone to the Arctic and we have seen in Alaska our country's first climate refugees as sea level rise melts the permafrost, the very, the very foundation of these indigenous people's lands, and they've had to move further inland, away from where they have been literally for centuries. Uh, we look at out west, fire season. Well, it's no longer a fire season, it's just a fire year non-stop wildfires. We just reported uh, two days ago that it looks like for the third year in a row, and it's only happened twice in the last 50 years, 60 years, that there will be three La Niñas in a row, the La Niña being uh, the cooling of the Pacific waters. Why do we care about that? We care about it because it means more wildfire and more drought out west. It means stronger tornadoes in the midsection of the country, and it means more rapidly intensifying hurricanes along the Gulf Coast and making their way up along the eastern seaboard. And make no mistake, even if you don't live along a coast, what we have seen now, rainstorms that are producing 30% more rain than they were 30 years ago. All of this with a rapidly warming climate, warming oceans, and those com combine to bring this witch's brew of what we call climate change to our shores. And not just here, but globally. And when you think about it, uh, you think, oh, well, it's, it's rain or it's a, a, a bigger snowstorm. It's more than that. It's our very security. 
a recent survey study from the U.S. Department of Defense lists climate change as the number one threat to homeland security. And when you think about it, over 70% of U.S. military installations are where? Along shorelines. And so now the Department of Defense is working on hardening military installations, not just in the United States, but all around the world because of climate change. For example, uh, here in the U.S. alone, last year, we had $20 billion, $20 billion plus weather slash climate events. That's the third largest number of climate events in the last 10 years. And in fact, in the, uh, in the last 10 years, seven years in a row, we've had climbing, we've had $10 billion weather events. In fact, last year, uh, Hurricane Ida, $75 billion in damage just on Hurricane Ida alone. So as we look at this, uh, we have had a very robust weather department at NBC News. But a few years ago, uh, our, our management said, we need to look at this on a more holistic approach. And so our NBC News climate unit was formed. We have an executive producer, and Aaron McGarry, uh, and we have producers, we have associate producers, meteorologists, uh, climate people who are looking at this. And what I like, what I, I, I find fascinating about our news uh, organization is that we have different units within our news department. We have a business and tech unit. We have a medical unit. We have an investigative unit. We have a racial justice unit. And guess what? Climate impacts every one of those units because they impact all of our lives. If there is a major hurricane that disrupts uh, supply chains, fuel supplies, different things like that, well, that means that businesses are going to be affected. Technology is affected. Climate touches that. By and large, communities of color are more affected and are placed closest to hazardous waste sites and polluting industries in this country than anybody else. That's racial justice. And when it comes to warming climate, allergy seasons go longer, more pestilence, more pests, mosquitoes, all sorts of uh, uh, problems arise due to a warming climate. And that affects our health. That touches our medical unit. Climate touches every part of our lives. And that's why we feel that it is so important to cover this, this really, I mean, this is the existential threat to our survival. It's not all doom and gloom. I mean, we try to make sure we let people know that there are solutions here. Uh, but our job is day in and day out, make sure we let people know that this is a real problem. We don't create, try to create hysteria. What we do try to do is bring information that affects your lives, how we can do things to, to change this climate curve that we're on. Can we electrify our transportation? Can we, can we maybe bring different food sources? For example, one of the things, listen, I'm a big meat eater, uh, but meat is, is not good for our planet. And so instead of making it the focal point, we try to make it, maybe it's a little less than a, of a focal point. Uh, when we think about something as simple as an almond, it takes one gallon of water to produce one almond. It takes five gallons of water to produce a walnut. If you take one year, the one year of water it takes to produce the California almonds that are exported to other countries, that could provide three years of water for residents and businesses for the city of Los Angeles. And it's those items, it's those things that we try to bring to our viewers that, not to demonize any one industry, but to say, how do we change it? How do we rethink what we're doing? And that is why we, we do what we do at the NBC News Climate Unit. Uh, and, and what was interesting is 
When we first started, when I first started talking about climate, uh, I won't say with our, our current management, but in previous uh, folks, they said, oh, nobody cares. Nobody wants to hear about that. It's doom and gloom. They don't care. Well, guess what? Our audience cares. You care. That's why you're here. But folks all across the country, and really all around the world, care about this. Why? Well, because we know our climate is changing. But even more importantly, our younger generation knows. I've got a daughter who's 24, I've got a son who's 20, I've got a daughter who's in her early 30s, and every one of them talk at our dinner table, if they're at the dinner table. <laughs> it's a sad story. Anyway, um, uh, they talk about climate, how things are changing. No matter where I go, people come up to me and they ask about it. They care about it. And guess what? Consumers, especially younger consumers, are, are demanding that the businesses that they, they take part in, that the people they deal with, that the people they work for are good stewards of our climate. They want to know that this is important because it's important to them, because they're the ones who are going to be inheriting this planet. And so we try to give solutions. We talk about you know, nat uh, the national parks. Uh, I just had the, uh, the opportunity and privilege of interviewing uh, President Barack Obama about the national parks. He's got a series on Netflix uh, that looks not just at our, the US national parks, which really, we were the first country to have a national park back in 1882. And we've exported that all over the world. And our national parks, both locally, nationally, globally, are buffers for our climate. And, and, that's, and taking care of those places is a sacred trust. We have to do that. Uh, thinking about more weather-resistant landscaping you know, that, that doesn't use as much water, uh, planting crops that are more susceptible, they're less susceptible to disease and heat and drought. We have, to, we have to think outside the box, and that's what's so great about a conference like this. I, I'm, I mean, I, I am actually hopeful about our climate. Uh, when we put our minds to something, we can do it. You think back 20, 30 years ago, everybody was concerned about the hole in the ozone layer. It was, I mean, that radiation was reaching dangerous levels on Earth because of that hole, that protective uh, ozone layer was being, was being deteriorated. And then, on a global level, we made a choice to eliminate the, the chemicals that were harming, was, was, that was harming uh, that, that, that oh-so-thin layer that protected us. And guess what? That hole is just about gone. So can we do it? Yeah, we can. But it's going to take action demanding action from our politicians on a local, state, and federal level, that this is not something that is to be politicized, that this affects all of us, no matter what political stripe you are, where you are, it, racially, some people are, obviously, as we mentioned, more affected than others. But what's important is that we have to do this together, because if we don't, uh, the very ideals that Cheyenne talked about about five minutes ago will be for naught because this is our moment. We can do this. We still have some time, but we have to make sure that we, as, as a people, nationally and globally, do something about this. And that's why I am so proud to be part of the NBC News Climate Unit because we are not only going to lay out the problems, but we're also going to help with solutions. That's what people want. They want solution-based reporting, and that's what we try to do. And I will say rather proudly that I think we're far ahead of our competitors when we do this. And we, well, I, listen, I would love for them to pass me by, and then we could pass them by, because everybody would benefit from it. But in the end, we all win if we all pull together. And I just want to say that I think that being here in Miami a city and an area, South Florida, is one of the ground zeros for climate. And people are getting things done here. People are coming together to get it done. And that's what we can do. So I hope you will join me 
in trying to come up with these solutions. And you know what? That's why we're here, because we want to hear from folks like you who have great ideas, who have great thoughts, and there's no idea that's too small or too out of the box to consider, because you never know where that's going to happen, because our planet is at stake. Thank you so much for listening, and have a great day. And now, John Doerr, Ryan Pachatsaram with Dieter Holger of The Wall Street Journal. Welcome to our audience here in Miami and online around the world. My name is Dieter Holger with The Wall Street Journal. We're joined here with John Doerr and Ryan Panchan Saram of Kleiner Perkins. Last year, amid the climate negotiations in Glasgow, they published Speed and Scale, a book that provides a blueprint of how to get to net zero. Let's start off laying out the action plan you put together in your book, Speed and Scale, specifically what you call objectives, results, and accelerants to get the world there. John, maybe you want to start off and then Ryan can come in. We can do that. <laughs> uh, all of you should have a copy of this book, or there's one outside this auditorium. And it's not really a book, it's a plan. And the way it came to be is, a while ago, I was watching Al Gore's seminal movie, An Inconvenient Truth. And after we saw it, my family came home for dinner, and I asked my friends and two daughters what they thought. We kind of went around the table, and my the conversation came to my 16-year-old daughter, Mary. And she, she looked at me and she said, Dad, I'm scared and I'm angry. Your generation created this problem. You better fix it. So <clears throat> I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I set out with my partners to learn as much as I could about this climate crisis. And over the course of a few years, we invested in 70 early stage breakthrough companies to try to solve the problem. Um, but as we worked on this, what I realized was there's a lot of goals for climate change. What the world needs is a plan. Not necessarily the best plan, but just one plan that's scientifically based where the numbers all add up. And it shows us a way to meet my daughter's challenge, to get us to net zero by 2050 and halfway there by 2030. And so that's what speed and scale is. It's a plan to get us to net zero by 2050. There are six big elements of this plan. I'd like to show them to you. They are the places where we can reduce emissions by some 59 gigatons. There are simply, one, to electrify our transportation, use electric cars and trucks. Second, to decarbonize our grid. That's to generate our electricity from wind and solar and safe nuclear. Third, to fix our food systems. That includes reducing voluntarily the amount of beef that we eat, but also how we grow our food and how much of our food's wasted 35% of the food in the world is wasted. A fourth major step is to protect nature. And by that, I mean our rainforests, our sea forests, our peatlands. That's a source of great emissions reduction. Fifth, we must clean up industry. That's how we make our concrete and our steel. We've got to find ways to do that with less, indeed, with zero carbon. And speaking of carbon, if we're successful in our plan with those first five, there's still going to be 10 of those 59 gigatons that I call the stubborn carbon that we've got to remove by mechanical or other growing new forest kinds of means. Now, that's the plan, six big hairy ass objectives. <laughs> Each of them is a monumental effort in its own right and we've got to do them all at the same time. Even worse than that, we've got to do this rapidly. Ryan? And so John shared the first part of the plan, right? How to go from 59 to zero. 
but we've got to get there faster. And so what we have in the book is we call these accelerants. Uh, there are four of them. Aha, here we are. These four accelerants are the things that you and I can do to get us to that net zero future by 2050 and halfway by 2030. And so what we've got to do is win the policy and politics, right? These are actually pla passing the laws needed to accelerate this transition. It's about turning movements into action from the ballot box to the boardroom, getting companies to make net zero commitments, getting people elected that take climate seriously. It's also about innovation, which is driving down the cost of technologies. And then the fourth accelerant we can pull on is called investment, right? This transition needs more R&D dollars, it needs more venture capital, and it also needs more project financing. So everyone's bag has a copy of this poster. This is it, it's a plan. You can get it for free. It's on the website <laughs> Speed and Scale, speedandscale.com, you can download it. On one side, you have these 10 big, Jim Collins would say this, hairy ass objectives. But what's wonderful, what's magical about the plan is those 10 objectives then become 55 detailed, <laughs> measurable time, I mean, this is an engineer's delight. <laughs> That, that shows the gigatons that can be removed, and it lets us track our progress against these. Ryan, do you want to give a couple of examples? Yeah, I'm going to give one example. So each of these objectives is paired up with a set of key results. And so we're nerdy engineers that took objectives and key results, and we applied it to the climate crisis, and this is what you get. You get KRs, key results like this, KR 1.1, which is that the cost of electric vehicles needs to be cheaper than its fossil fuel equivalent. If in, by 2024, it isn't cheaper, we can't expect people to switch to EVs. Or take the key result around buses. By 2025, every city should be purchasing electric buses or hydrogen buses. If a new diesel bus goes on the road, we know we're off track. And so that's the plan, all in a nutshell, presented as 10 objectives and 55 key results. Dieter. Thank you very much. Not to belager the point, because it was obviously an emotional moment for you, John, but you started off the book with how angry your daughter was, then 15 at the time, after that viewing of Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth. She accused your generation of helping create the environmental problems we face. Do you expect your generation to address the problem, and how optimistic are you about getting to net zero? So we're making remarkable progress. The cost of wind and solar has plummeted. It's now cheaper to put up renewable energy than new dirty fossil fuel coal burning fired power plants. But the rate of our improvement is not keeping pace. We're not gaining ground on the problem. The most recent IPCC report said, we're out of time. There's, there's no more time left to, to spare. We, we've got to achieve these key results to have a reasonable chance of delivering one and a half degrees increase Celsius in temperature by 2050, and even more demanding to get halfway there in terms of emission reductions by 2030. So I would, we, we, we talked about this recently, the, the, the family. Uh, they're still angry, and what I say to them is it's gonna be up to them and us together if we're to solve this problem. Let's turn to the past as we look to the future. There was an ill-fated venture boom in clean tech earlier on in the 21st century. Following that, Kleiner Perkins' investments in clean tech have cooled, though you have set up a separate firm called G2VP that's focused on sustainability. What lessons have you learned from these failed investments that we can apply now to make sure we meet the objective of net zero? Ryan, could you start and then we could move to John, please. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I get the, uh, I've had the fortunate ability to work with John for the past five years and around the Kleiner team. And they learned a world of uh, lessons from that early first deployment. But I think the one number to kind of look at is the, this concept of performance and the concept of cost, right? I think what's on us as innovators today as we build new companies, the things we build have to actually perform better than the fossil fuel equivalent. Because when, when you do, you start to win, right? It's why people are picking EVs. They're really convenient to charge at home. It's why people are putting their solar and storage on their homes in California and Texas, because it creates resilience. But also cost was an important factor as well too, Dieter. This whole idea of the green premium that Gates 
you know, coined, if the green thing is more expensive, right? Remember that KR around price for cars? People aren't going to switch. But as soon as that green premium gets to zero and then becomes negative, that's a green discount, and markets love that. So over uh, about seven years, we invested a billion dollars, this is in the book, in some 70 different climate startups. Eight of them made solar stuff and panels. One of them was Fisker. I should have invested in Tesla. But those billion dollars <laughs> of investment, worst decision I made. <laughs> that billion dollars of invested at the time of the book's writing was worth $3 billion. So it wasn't a write-off. But there's some really important lessons that have been learned in an ever-growing community. First of all, you've got to be ruthless about getting your risks up front and out of the way early. Second, you are always raising money. It takes more time, it takes more money to build these climate tech ventures. Third, as Ryan suggested, the costs are king. You've got to take all your innovation and devote it to lowering the cost because consumers don't want to pay any more for something green. It's got to be green and cost competitive. Fourth, the incumbents are going to fight back at you and they will fight dirty. Mm -hmm. The book is full of stories about that. Fifth and finally, it takes patience, perseverance, and uncommonly an incredible sense of urgency to win in this work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Winning politics and policy is also part of your book. We are about to hear from Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Other politicians are gathering here in Miami. Um, but of course, the IPCC, that's the pivotal UN bellwether report on climate change, over and over named that corporate lobbying is a major obstruction to climate action. So specifically here in the United States, what needs to change politically if net zero is going to be accomplished? John, could you start and then we can go to Ryan, please. Well, uh, there's two of these big goals that deal with politics. One is winning the politics and policy. The other equally important one is how do we turn movements into action? And so I want to read you one of the key results. Key result 8.1. The climate crisis needs to be a top two voting issue in the 20 top emitting countries by 2025. Now, you remember in 2018, Greta Thunberg was a lone Swedish teenager striking from school in front of parliament on Fridays by herself. By 2019, she'd organized a million youth in 100 cities around the world in one of the most successful demonstrations ever that the adults were screwing the kids in their future. But she did something even more important than that. Our surveys show that she took climate and raised its priority from number three or four to a top two issue in seven European nations. Now, climate is not a top two issue in the US. It's not a top two issue in China. It's not a top two issue in India. And so I'm counting on the anger and activism of youth to raise this issue, because it's very hard for our political leaders to get ahead of their voters. And a counterexample we're going to hear from in just a few minutes. I cannot wait to hear from Nancy Pelosi. She is courageous. She's the most effective politician, in, in my judgment, that we have in Washington, DC. And she is determined to get climate legislation through the United States, in spite of the fact that it's not a top two voting issue today. Thank you, John. Ryan, do you have anything to add there, particularly around lobbying? And we know that uh, for politicians, climate change isn't a top fundraising issue either. You know, how, how John said, the, the incumbents are going to fight, right? They're going to fight tooth and nail to keep their revenue streams alive, right? We talk about that 59 billion tons of emissions. Those emissions are someone else's business model. And so if you want to change the status quo, right, as you can see, John and I are leaning on the other levers. So if the policy and politics aren't working, John talked about leaning on turning movements into action. I'm going to say as innovators, we have to lean on the technology and actually driving down the cost of it. Because when you do that, it can compete. You can also lean on the investment lever as well, too. If you deploy more, cost curves go down. And so when one of the levers is failing, lean on one of the, <laughs> pull the others effectively. We have to make the right outcome the profitable outcome, so it's the probable outcome. None of these key results are given. They are all stretched. They are all very ambitious. We will fail at some 
will exceed others along the way. But we will not get this done if we don't harness the forces of business and the financial markets to take us into this new clean energy economy. Thank you. Admittedly, some of us in the media might focus a bit on the negatives around climate change, but there are some positive things as well. I'm hoping we can end our talk today with some of the positive developments you've seen recently, maybe after even these negotiations, these pivotal negotiations in Glasgow. Uh, Ryan, if you'd like to start off, please. Yeah, you know, if we tried to write this book three or four years ago, we wouldn't be able to celebrate the number of companies that are doing great work, from the Beyond Meats, to the Sun Runs, to the End Phases, to the Teslas that are leading on this revolution. If we wrote this book just five years ago, solar and wind was still more expensive. And today, right, when folks walked into Glasgow, it was actually cheaper, right? When you look at the amount of, uh, uh, the amount of people that are finally buying EVs, just three or four years ago, it was barely a percent. And at the end of last year, it finally crossed the 10 to 11% mark. So this momentum is real. The change that we want to see happen is real. But because this is an analog problem and not a digital one, it's going to be very, very hard. John, some positives, please. <laughs> I want to tell, talk about some positives that came out of the Glasgow conference, mm -hmm. which Greta dismissed as being more blah, blah, blah. You may remember that. And also some developments post-Glasgow. Um, more nations of the world updated their plans. The plans are not aggressive enough. Even if we meet the plans, they won't get the job done. But they agreed to come back a year later with even more aggressive plans. There was a bold agreement that we're going to hear from Fred Krupp about on methane. The nations of the world said that methane is a particularly dangerous and potent greenhouse gas. And if we cap the leaks and the flaring of methane, we could lower the rise in temperature by perhaps as much as four-tenths of a degree. So the methane collaboration was very encouraging, though I don't, I don't believe the US quite signed up for some political reasons. Don't ask me, I would need to Google that. <laughs> I, I'd have to Google that one. <laughs> but I think the coming year will be the year of measurement, and we will see satellites and drones and aircraft providing, like Google Earth, a real-time map of emissions around the world. EDF is putting up its own satellite. Now, there was a report from the IPCC just within the last 60 days, and it's the one that warned us we must have peak emissions before 2025 to get to a 50-50 chance of one and a half degrees C increase. That's going to be very hard to do. But the good news out of that same IPCC report was when we reach true net zero, the temperatures on the planet are going to stop rising in three to four or five years. And if we stay at net zero, half of the emissions that are due to human activity will fall out in 25 to, to 30 years. So there's genuine reasons for hope and fear. What we've got to do is make sure that our fear and anger galvanize us into action. It doesn't paralyze us into despair or giving up. Thank you both, and thank you to our audience. Thank you. And now, please welcome Colorado Governor Jared Polis. Good evening. It's truly great to be here. Normally, I have the chance to join the Aspen Institute's deliberations back in Colorado during my time in Congress in Washington. Uh, in fact, I'll be joining the Aspen Ideas Festival this June. I hope many of you have the opportunity to join us there as well to highlight Colorado's climate preparedness efforts. But today, I'm thrilled that Aspen Institute is expanding horizons into communities like Miami across the country, and I'm so excited for this to become a meaningful tradition. The Aspen Institute is really, as you're about to find out, a unique forum for meaningful conversations with thought leaders from every walk of life to discuss pressing issues from climate change to justice to the economy to leadership. And I know that this week's conversations around climate change will be thought-provoking, 
inspirational, and meaningful for each and every one of you. Because whether we like it or not, climate change is not a distant threat. It's happening in our own backyards. In Colorado, we experienced the three largest wildfires in the history of our state in the summer of 2020, and the most destructive wildfire fire in the history of our state just last December. Uh, that's why in Colorado, we're leading the way with a goal of 100% renewable energy by 2040, and we have locked in at 80% renewable energy just seven and a half years from now, 2030. Here in Florida, the impacts of climate change might look different than forest fires, but they're every bit as dangerous and present in our everyday lives. When we have these critical conversations, we learn from one another and bring new ideas to the table. It is my deep honor to introduce somebody who is the greatest champion of climate change in the country and in the world, whether it's passing cap and trade through the House when I was a freshman member of Congress under her capable leadership, whether it's creating uh, the Special Committee on Climate, uh, chaired by Kathy Castor, who's with us here tonight, Florida's own, uh, or whether it's relentless pursuit of climate for the benefit of our kids, for the benefit of our future, for the future of our planet. There is really no one who parallels the capable leadership of the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House. During her time in Congress as leader of the Democratic Caucus, she has focused on real climate solutions. Uh, and she, more than any other leader, speaks to the need to act now on the climate emergency for a better future. Nancy Pelosi uh, will be interviewed by Susan Goldberg, a lifelong journalist and vice dean of Arizona State University. Uh, it's my deep honor to introduce our nation's premier climate leader, somebody that I have the great honor of calling a former colleague and friend. It's my honor to introduce the Honorable Nancy Pelosi. quite a greeting for you, for both of us. Well, oh, yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> it seems to me, based on what John Doerr said and the governor said, everybody thinks you are going to get something done about climate. But I wanted to ask you, when and how are you going to do that? Because <laughs> everybody has a lot of confidence, clearly. Well, it, that, thank you so much, Susan. It's an honor to be introduced by my former colleague, now the governor of Colorado. He was a leader in the Congress on the climate issues and so many other issues. And as a, a governor, a model to the rest of the country, Jared Polis, thank you for your kind words. I just want to get settled in here because we're in this place named now since Saturday night for Michael Tilson Thomas Performance Hall. I've been not in this auditorium, but where the performances take place uh, many years ago when he first started uh, here, like co here and in San Francisco. So it's wonderful to be in the Michael Tilson Thomas Performance Center and thank the Anderson family for making that possible. <laughs> we'll be here with Mayor Gelber and Mayor uh, Levine Kava, who are here. Uh, the mayors play a very important role in uh, they're resilient enough and small enough, big enough to make a difference, small enough to be resilient. And so that's really very, very important. And of course, the Aspen Institute, how exciting is it that they are doing this? And I want to acknowledge, of course, um, uh, the, the Dan Porterfield, the president and CEO of Aspen Institute, for having this auspices for this subject as big as the sky itself. Uh, I am here also with my, my colleague, Kathy Castor, who is the chair of our select committee on climate. And this is her plan. And it sounds very much like what I read in John Doerr's book, Solving the Climate Crisis, the Congressional Action Plan for a Clean Energy Economy 
and the Healthy, Resilient, and Just America. I read it so I would do it justice, uh, because you'll, some of you will hear from her tomorrow morning. And there, now to be here in between John Doerr, our hero, and the Krupp family, two families, it's not surprising that John talked about his daughters right from the start of his remarks, because it's always for him been about the future and accountability to our children. And the Krupp family, has, Fred Krupp will be speaking, have done so much in this regard. So here we are. Now, we've been trying to do this for a while. And it is uh, something that we would like to be as bipartisan as possible. That is a goal that has not been achieved yet. It used to be the uh, environmental community was largely uh, participated in by the uh, Republican Party. But so far, we haven't gotten to that on the climate crisis. The, um, we ha came close uh, in 2010. We passed the legislation in the House, but 60 votes in the Senate. And that was a challenge. But what some, I think John said, somebody said, now we must do this. And maybe Jared, it's long, long, long overdue. It's not about now, it's about then. It's about time that we do it now. It's about the time that has been wasted in not getting it done. When, when we were doing this before, it was my flagship issue then, when I was speaking the first time, and went under the poles. We were told that what we were seeing there, the melting and all the rest, by the time it was written up and peer review, it would be obsolete because more of the melting would have taken place. So this is urgent. And again, in California, it is, for the Democrats, a top three issue. But Madam, Madam a Speaker. A top three issue. But it hasn't gotten to that place throughout the country, and it hasn't gotten to that place. But I, I, my hope is what you heard John Doerr. He gives me hope, because there's a plan. It's a vision, there's a plan. And young people understand this more clearly than anyone. Well, I want to talk to you about young people in just a second, but I did want to ask you about the urgency. So we've got the midterms coming up. You know, I, and I've read a lot that if these bills aren't passed, if something about climate doesn't happen by the July 4th recess, the chances of anything really happening are going, are going to go down. Do you agree with that? And well, what, what would you do about it? We passed the bill in the House a long time ago. Absolutely. Six, a half a trillion dollars to address the climate drought. A half a trillion dollars. Now in the Senate, they're still negotiating, and hopefully they will get something. But at the same time, just think of this. I was just in uh, Ukraine, but when I was in Munich, a few uh, end of February, I heard, I heard the, uh, the head of the uh, EU and other leaders of Europe come forth and say, we can no longer be slave, enslaved to oil or other energy products from countries that will use that as a security, a national security, a global security issue. We must diversify. And I think since then, you have seen steps being taken by European countries, and certainly our country, to reduce our dependence on those countries which will use it as leverage, as leverage. The, what they said to us in February is, the end of February, is we are paying for Russia to fight the war in Ukraine because we're buying their oil and their other energy products. So let's think in, in a, what we have to do here, but what we have to think globally. The issue of climate has always been a health issue. Clean air, clean water, and pollution. It has always been a, an economic issue, green technologies. Green technology to be preeminent, and that's why hearing John Doerr talk about the private sector and its role in all this is so important. It's always, now, it's always been a security issue because um, a national security experts tell us that the rising sea levels, encroachment of desert, you, all the things that you know are happening are uh, making it more urgent in terms of competition for habitat and, and resources, even food, 
because of the climate crisis. So it's always been a security issue, now even more so when you see, when you see the blackmail of a Russia on this issue. And it is, of course, always a moral issue. If you believe, as I do, that this is God's creation, we have a moral responsibility to good stewards. But even if you don't, we have a moral responsibility to the next generation, uh, to the future, to be good stewards of this planet. So we have all the reason in the world to do this. It's hard to understand why there are obstacles to it. I know. It's hard for me to understand, so it must be very hard for you to understand. But we still are optimistic that we can get some of the, uh, the provisions in the Build Back Better legislation so this year. So without making this all about Joe Manchin, I mean, he has been, <laughs> but just <Hello>? to, <laughs> but he has been, um, you know, having some, some meetings and discussions. Are you hopeful at all about those? And have you personally reached out to Joe Manchin? Joe Manchin and I are Italian-American. We're Catholics. We have our friendship. I've helped him with, um, with, even though I think clean coal is an oxymoron, and I've told the coal miners that, I've helped. I do believe in their getting their benefits, whether it's pension or health care. And so we've worked on those, uh, on those issues together, and uh, we have had our conversations. But right now, this conversation is a Senate conversation, but we're just optimistic and hopeful. But you know what? We really can't take no for an answer. So what we have to do is make sure that whatever the party, and I would hope that it would be as strongly bipartisan as possible, that we can get enough votes in September. I mean, excuse me, no, but, well, September would be good too, but November, <laughs> because we have to get this done for the children. And, and it's not just about getting enough votes to pass it, it's about getting enough votes to p push back the filibuster rule so that it can pass without getting 60 votes, because that would be very hard uh, to get uh, in the Senate at this time. Well, so how are you gonna persuade Joe Manchin that he needs to move a little bit? And how well, are you gonna persuade members of your own party that it's not gonna be the dream bill that they wanted? Well, the, the, let me just, I mean, I wouldn't come here to talk politics, but if you want to talk politics. <laughs> oh, come on. I'm okay <laughs> with that. <laughs> no, here's the thing. The House Democrats and the Senate Democrats have been firmly on this path for a long time. Oh, such a long time. I'm, when I'm seeing John Doerr, I'm remembering that like in 19, no, 2005, we started at Stanford, where he just made this magnificent grant for this Institute for Climate. Uh, isn't it? It's so remarkable. <laughs> and we met by, down there to talk about how we go into the future, what our competitiveness legislation would be. And one part of it became the law the next year that created something called ARPA-E. Anybody know what ARPA-E is? ARPA-E is a real, it's a giant step forward in protecting us in terms of how we use energy. And we've come a long way with that. And actually, with it, we passed one of the biggest bills in, um, in, in history on energy with President Bush, the, the elect, uh, uh, energy bill of 2007 with President Bush. He wanted, he wanted nuclear, I wanted renewables, And uh, we had a big celebration at the signing. And sadly, what happened is Japan kind of slowed down some of the nuclear part. But we proceeded with that. And, and um, in any event, President Bush signed that bill with ARPA-E in there. So we had not complete agreement, don't get me wrong, but we made, we made progress. So again, my. The House Democrats, the Senate Democrats are all there. There is, um, I think that what I want to see, what I think we have to have out of the half a trillion dollars are the tax credits for uh, wind and solar and uh, renewables so that we can proceed with that. What he might get with that remains to be seen. All right, so it sounds like you think you're going to get something done here. 
Well, that would be the goal. I mean, at some point, you, at some point, you, you know, in other words, um, I want it all, but that, that doesn't happen. So what's the, I like a high split, though. I like the split in my direction. So you know, you've, you've but we cannot miss the opportunity. And if we do, we must remember in November, we have to get more people thinking about it. So let me just say this, now getting back to the bipartisan. Um, president Lincoln, my favorite Republican president, he said, public sentiment is everything. With it, you can accomplish almost anything. Without it, practically nothing. So, so we have to beat the drum of public sentiment on this. And again, younger people seem to be more receptive, more concerned. It's their future, and they're willing to take responsibility for it. And I know in some families where the parents are in the fossil fuel industry and the kids are saying, what are you doing to save the planet, mom and dad? So again, there's reason to be hopeful because of young people. But we have no choice. I mean, in 2010, when we passed Waxman-Markey, we were told that we, it was, we were at the end. We only had about 10 more years left. Well, those 10 years have gone by, have gone by. So again, if you're a person of faith, why aren't you protecting this planet? If you care about the children and the air they breathe, and by the way, let me just say something about President Biden. He is a champion on this issue. He takes great pride in saying that he was the first member of Congress, well, maybe in the Senate, but first member of Congress <laughs> to have any legislation about climate, 1986. I wasn't even there then. 1986. <laughs> He had legislation in the Senate addressing the climate issue. So when we talked to him about it, he said, you don't have to tell me. I was there before everybody. This is a priority for us. This is a priority. And he understands that it must be done. So what is the, shall we say, what's a nice way to say trade-off? <laughs> There's an agreement to be made, OK? Let's just find it, and let's find it soon, because time Time. The clock is ticking, whether it's ticking uh, in terms of the cost. You know, Aspen Institute and some others have put together a clock. You know how they have that clock that says how much the, the um, national budget is going up, uh, the, the um, national debt? Well, this clicks about $5,000 a second as the harm that we are doing. And it's about $5,000 a second, about 180 some billion dollars a year. So when people say, well, we can't afford that, no, we can't afford not to do it. We can't afford not to do it. So you've mentioned children a number of times here, and I know you've got nine grandchildren. I think nine grandchildren. Is, nine grandchildren. Do you hear from them about this? And, oh, yeah. you know, kids have a great way of kind of cutting through all of the, you know, BS and getting to the heart of a matter. What, right. what do you hear from them about the urgency of this or what they're most concerned about? Well, you have to remember they're my grandchildren. I mean, <laughs> this is how they were raised. And, uh, no, I mean, are my grandchildren and my children and their, and their friends, but grandchildren younger, they, um, it's hard. From our standpoint, we're from San Francisco. We're from California. They live in Texas, Arizona, New York, because that's where they live. I say, when are you coming home? And they'll say, well, we are home. That's our home. And, and so they kind of understand uh, that everybody doesn't agree with us, as, as one might think if you just lived in San Francisco. Not just lived, lived in San Francisco. Home of the Golden State Warriors living in San Francisco. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's so self-evident. You don't want me to get too political here, do you? I mean, the fossil fuel industry, it, they weigh in so significantly. I mean, how could it be that nobody on the Senate side cares, on the, in the Senate cares about 
climate? Some of them do, and they talk about it. When it comes to the votes, it just isn't there. They just aren't there. So rather than saying, well, we have to defeat them, no, let's just try to persuade them. I want the Republican Party to take back the party, take it back to where you were, where you cared about a woman's right to choose, and you cared about the environment, and all. <laughs> and all the great, all the, hey, here I am, Nancy Pelosi, saying this country needs a strong Republican Party, and we do. Not a cult, but a strong Republican Party. <laughs> make this as bipartisan as possible and not, but right now it's, you know, people say I signed up to be part of the climate, this or that, which means nothing unless you're going to put your vote where you're signing up, signing up it. So let's just strive to make it partisan. So in terms of my grandchildren, that's not really a good test <laughs> because, right. you know, that's how they were raised. That's and that's what it's about. And by the way, we're people of faith. You know, we're devout Catholics and that, and this is God's creation. And what are we doing? And so we even have some evangelicals who have joined us. Now, let me just talk about this one thing. Kathy Casher is going to be speaking to young people tomorrow. I don't know where they make the cut to get into the young people part, but not, <laughs> <laughs> that's a level of politics I could never succeed in. But nonetheless, She's going to be speaking. She is spectacular and chairs our group. And that, with that group at the table, she has everyone. She has what, both sides of it. She has people of faith and she has the scientists. She has the farmers. She has evangelical, the um, uh, environmentalists and the labor unions and the business community. She has the farmers. She has the venture capitalists. She has every aspect of what it takes to get consensus so that people don't feel harmed about what we're doing. And we've had evangelicals speak at our events because they believe that it, it's God's creation. So we have that responsibility. But even if you don't share that view, you know that it, our ultimate response. That's why when I was speaking the first time, my flagship issue was the, the climate issue and we passed the Waxman-Markey bill. It was great, but we couldn't, we couldn't pass it in the Senate. So it has been your flagship issue for a long time and you've yeah. been very involved in it. You mentioned earlier though that you've got to get public sentiment really That's to, right. to mm -hmm. get this to move. And what I wonder is, you know, we're living in a time of so many crises, right? Americans, unfortunately, we're about to mark our one millionth death um, from COVID, we had our own citizens storming the Capitol. We have an unprovoked attack on Ukraine. There are so many other crises. How do we keep people's attention focused on this to get something done? That's such a wonderful question, and I thank you for it. The, I think we have to come at it every possible way. Uh, being in this institution, which is an institution for the arts, I'm a big believer that the arts can save us. In the, ninth, the, uh, in, the ninth, in the 19th century, in the 19th century, now the eight, that would be the 1800s, in the 19th century, there was a movement that said that poets should talk more about science and scientists should frame things more in an artistic way so that people could understand and be motivated by it. Uh, I think that, that what they were saying, that, that's, that was the romantic poet. So Alfred Lord Tennyson was one of them. In fact, when you come to the Capitol and you go to the science, space, and technology hearing room, who's on the wall but Alfred Lord Tennyson? I looked in the future as far as the eye could see and the wonder of it all, of what the future could be. Alfred Lord Tennyson in the science, space, and technology room. So everything, whether it's music, whether it's um, poetry, uh, but we, we have to connect with people in the way that they receive information. You have been so great in this and so many of the things that you have done at the National Geographic, Wall Street Journal, <laughs> <laughs> 
No, no and Nat Geo. Nat Geo. She, Susan, Susan, has been really, spe really spectacular in this regard because she sees uh, the, uh, weighing the equities and sees the opportunities that are there. You know about communication better than any of us. And so w when I'm saying this about music and how we come together, we forget our differences, right? We come together, listen to music, we laugh together, we cry together, we're inspired together, we're taken to a different values place that can say, really? We're not going to save this planet for our children? Well, I do think it is a struggle to figure out how to tell the stories to get people's attention and to keep it there. And that's something certainly I struggle with at National Geographic and I think all journalists struggle with. But let me ask you another thing, which is that you know the climate crisis, like every other bad thing, doesn't play out evenly. Um, you know, Because of a legacy of redlining, a lot of um, black and brown Americans who are living in neighborhoods with fewer trees, those neighborhoods are on average five degrees hotter than leafy neighborhoods in the same cities. People in those neighborhoods are breathing in, <clears throat> excuse me, more particulate matter. So the climate crisis really has an environmental justice issue about it. What should the government be doing about that? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question because this is the heart of the matter. And I was gonna say Joe Biden. President Biden has been a real champion. And in our bills, whether it's the infrastructure bill, which has a good deal of uh, climate initiatives in it. It's not everything, but it goes in the right direction. Has a 40% sort of standard that has to address environmental justice. When we talk about clean air, clean water, we talk about asthma, communities of color, and th the environmental injustice of it all is so apparent. When we were doing the infrastructure bill, some of the members said, well, I'm not gonna build any more infrastructure because they build roads through our neighborhoods and divide us, and the president said, this is a bill about bringing people together to take down those divisions in neighborhoods and the rest. So if you're talking about environmental justice, that's a very important part of, of the legislation that we have in every way. Getting the lead out of the water that our children are drinking and have done, uh, damaging their capacity to think and, and learn and the rest. So this is, a, thank you for asking because it is the heart of the matter and is what is different about it than anything that has gone before in terms of building the infrastructure of America and now addressing the climate, the climate issues. Well, let me ask for the children. It's always for the children. Even your grandchildren, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and your grandchildren, too. Yeah. So at some point, uh, Speaker Pelosi, even you are going to end your congressional career. Um, and you know, right now, we've got a situation where the battle for an urgent response to climate change is very difficult to achieve. Democrats are struggling to hang on to the House. Um, and there's a lot of other things that you really care about that are in play or at risk. So on a personal level, what does this moment mean to you? Is that a political question? It sounded like one to me. But then again, everything sounds that way to me. Now, um, now I, I, you always have to be make, we always have to be making progress. But enough already with the progress. Let's just get the job done. This is what the choice is. Weigh the equities. You may have, no, nobody ever gets everything. They, well, there is no such thing as a perfect bill. But we do have to be at a place where we are meeting the needs of people in every possible way. So for me, the, the, uh, this issue, again, is a health issue. It's a jobs issue. It's a national security issue, and it's a values issue. It, so much falls under the, the climate issue, and we have to get something done. And we have to understand the relationship to elections, to it. Now, it doesn't mean just vote Democratic. It means make sure that the people you vote for know what you care about, and know, ask them where they are on it because this can't go on for a long time. You know, just between us, don't tell anybody I said that. 
they, these uh, fossil fuel companies, they're out there saying we're doing this to save the planet and that, and we did $25 million. Oh, really? I don't mean buy a cup of coffee in the world of climate change. So why, you know, don't let people get away with saying things to represent that they're doing something when they're not. But of course, we came back, here we have, look at, look at this week. We came back from Ukraine last Monday, one week ago. We see the leader of a country, Russia, making animals of his soldiers who are raping little girls 11 years old and their mothers in front of them, attacking civilians in maternity hospitals, schools, and the rest. This is unfathomable. I wear this ring about Afghanistan and the women of Afghanistan, they made this ring so that we don't forget them. But look at that, the Taliban are putting them in burqas. But the Taliban are the Taliban, that's a horrible thing. This man's the head of Russia. And he's attacking, he's going into a country. Well, you, you, know, you know how horrible it is. But the fact is that people can't get away with that kind of behavior. And they cannot be financed in doing it by our dependence on fossil fuels in their country. It's all connected. When my kids were little, we used to go to Marin County, across the bridge, and Mrs. Twilliger was the, she, she taught kids about nature. Everything in nature is connected. It was a lesson for the children, little children then. It's a lesson for us now. It's all connected. And we have to, again, if you believe that we are all God's creation, and the spark of divinity exists in people, or if, even if you don't believe that, but you believe in the dignity and worth of people, you have to come to a different conclusion. I'm really happy that we'll have strong bipartisanship. I'm hoping to build, bring the bill up tomorrow on Ukraine. They asked me, can you do it by the end of May? I'm like, no, I think the end of the week, that we will bring up that bill so that we send a clear message of support, whether it's humanitarian support, whether it's economic support, whether it's sanctions, 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 or whether it is um, three things, weapons, weapons, and weapons. Is there anything worse for the environment than war? Is that horrible to see what they're doing to the, he's doing to the environment and, and what is necessitated in war? So this doesn't, it isn't, it's outside the circle of civilized human behavior. And as a country, we have to find our common ground to come together to do something about it. Now, what I tell people, see, Susan and I may have a disagreement, about, well, I don't know. I have no intention of losing the house in November. Oh, okay. <laughs> And, and, and when we're encouraging people to run, and I especially want more women to run, because nothing is more wholesome than more women. Not, <laughs> and then, no, no disrespect to the men. It doesn't mean women are better. It means diversity is better at the table, whether it's cultural, ethnic, whatever diversity is at the table. So when I say to these women, this is really hard. It's really hard. I don't want you to think this is an easy thing. This is not for the faint of heart when you get into that arena, I can tell you that. It's not for the faint of heart. But when you're in that arena, you gotta be ready to take a punch. And you gotta be ready to throw a punch for the children. <laughs> Speaker Pelosi, it is always a pleasure to talk to you <laughs> for the children, and um, thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for listening. And let's thank Susan. For being here.
And now, Kate Larson. I lead a global research team of economists, energy modelers, and scientists at the Rhodium Group, an independent research firm. This research is critical to understanding where we are today, how effective our efforts have been, and what we need to do now. So I'll start with the good news. Since the Paris Agreement was adopted, we've massively shifted down our expectations about the pace of growth of global emissions over the, over the next few decades. Before the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015, we expected emissions to continue to grow at a pretty steady clip over the next few decades. But with the pledges that were adopted and submitted as part of the, of the Paris Agreement for the near term, for the 2030 time period, we have now bent that curve and expect emissions to remain flat. That's not where we need to be, but is a significant improvement on where we expect it to be. So in 2040, that means that emissions will be about a third less than we thought they would be only seven years ago. And that, the emission reductions that we have locked in now have been pretty evenly distributed across a wide range of different countries, both developed and developing. Some of this comes from a de decreased expectation for economic growth, but much of it is from decreasing in energy intensity of these economies and a decrease in the carbon intensity of that energy. That's really ex now slowed our expectations about how much warming we'll see uh, over the course of the century. So before Paris, the world was on track to to see warming of about 4.6 degrees centigrade. With the, the current 2030 pledges that have been put in place to date, now we're expecting to limit warming to around 2.6 degrees Celsius. Again, this is not where we need to be, but every fraction of a degree of warming that we can avoid today will make a huge difference. Let me put that into some human terms. Before the Paris Agreement, we expected to see as much as 200 million additional premature deaths just from heat-related mortality, from people suffering from heat stroke. Now, with the pledges that have been put in place to date by 2030, we've reduced the expected deaths by 80%. When you look at sea level rise, with the pledges, we've reduced expected number of people that would be impacted by sea level rise by a quarter to a third. And as we all know, the people who are most impacted by climate change are the ones who have contributed the least to global emissions. Um, this shows the expected rise in heat-related mortality across the world as a result of climate change, produced by the Climate Impact Lab, a consortium of economists and scientists from the Rhodium Group and other academic institutions. As you can see, the types of heat waves that have devastated India and Pakistan today will become the norm in much of Africa the Middle East, even Southern Europe and the Southern US. And we know it's the communities within these countries that are the lowest income that are the most impacted. So again, every, every fraction of a degree really matters. But we know the 2030 pledges are just the first step. Many countries, in fact, 80 countries, representing three quarters of global emissions, have committed to reduce their, their emissions to zero by mid-century. I think this is something that everyone present at the adoption of the Paris Agreement, I don't think there are many people who would have predicted that we would be here today. It is a massive um, change from where we were only seven years ago. So if all of those net zero goals are implemented, that means we can limit warming to around 1.9 to two degrees Celsius. That goal still doesn't meet the, our 1.5 degree goal, but it is a very imp important uh, indicator that we can do this. But this is premised on full Im implementation of all of these pledges. So if Paris was the era of raising ambition, getting new pledges from a whole stream of new actors, now is the era of implementation. And now, more than ever, there is broad agreement that all countries, all companies, need to get to net zero by, mid by mid-century. And now, more than ever, there is broad agreement about how to do this. Um, so using the US as an example, I'll, I'm happy to echo John Doerr, 
the types of actions we need to take are very clear. One, rapidly decarbonize the electric power sector within the next decade. Two, electrify everything we can, vehicles, cars, most trucks, buildings. Three, develop and deploy the advanced clean fuels that we need to decarbonize the most hard to abate sectors, industry, aviation, shipping, the kinds of fuels like green hydrogen and sustainable aviation fuels. Four, we need to um, reduce emissions like HFCs that come from air conditioning and refrigeration and methane from oil and gas production and agriculture. Five, we need to protect our natural lands and help them to sequester carbon. And six, for all the remaining carbon, we need to capture it and store it. To do this will require a massive scale up of the technologies that we have available today, wind, solar, electric vehicles. It will also require massive investment and innovation in the technologies that are not commercially at scale today, clean hydrogen, direct air capture, sustainable aviation fuels, and others. This will require companies, governments, and investors all to work together to make sure that they make good on their commitments for net zero. And to do that, it will require public action, public, public political will, and to do that requires people to use their purchasing power, their protesting power, and in particular, their voting power. Thank you. And now, Fred Krupp and Catherine McKenna with Justin Worland of Time Magazine. Okay, well, uh, here with Catherine McKenna, who is the former Minister of Environment and Climate Change of Canada, and uh, chair of the UN Secretary General's new Debt Zero Task Force for Companies, business and Businesses, and Cities, and Fred Krupp, who is the uh, president, longtime president of the Environmental Defense Fund. I'm Justin Worland, a correspondent at Time Magazine. And here we are to talk about methane, uh, the last thing standing between you all and drinks. Um, and uh, for many of you, though, it, methane is, uh, many of you will know methane is a critically important. Uh, it's the second most prevalent greenhouse gas after carbon. It is, it's hard to say exactly, but it is more than 25 times as potent uh, at trapping heat in the atmosphere as carbon. Uh, and so I want to start by asking the two of you to just set the stage and tell us a little bit about why methane is so important and what is the opportunity that we have uh, in capturing it in the short term. So Catherine, we'll start with you. I really feel bad about the drinks thing. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll keep it tight. Um, look, I, I, you know, we'll get into the technical part about this, but when you think about how potent methane is, and it is 84 times more potent in the first two decades compared to CO2. I'm from Canada. Any Canadians here? Yay, yes. one. Yay! <laughs> they didn't should all be in Miami, better weather. Um, but it, uh, when you think about Canada and our Arctic, um, we, we don't have time. And just think about the challenge we have if we don't tackle it. And it's often underestimated. In Canada, we think, uh, from the oil and gas industry, it's 1.5 times higher. Well, the uh, simplest way I can put it, Justin, is that um, right now, methane is causing just about 30% of all the warming we're experiencing. But starting now, the methane that we're putting into the atmosphere from all sources is doing more over the next 10 years to warm our planet 
than all the burning of all the fossil fuel over the same time period. That's the stake. So bringing methane emissions down cuts temperatures immediately yep. from what they would otherwise be. Right. Well, I won't belabor the drinks joke, but it is, uh, it is critically important, I think, a good session to end on. So let, let's just talk. I'm a journalist. Think about the news. Uh, I'm curious to ask about, uh, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has, has led to uh, challenges with, with natural gas, and of course methane uh, is natural gas. And so I, I guess I would just start uh, with you, Fred, and ask, what does methane mean in the conversation about Russia-Ukraine? What, what, what is the significance of methane there? Well, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine the same week that the new IPCC report came out and said that we have to move faster. But we now have, therefore, two imperatives. One, we've got an energy crisis caused by uh, the invasion. And two, we continue to have a climate crisis that threatens all, all of us and all of our futures. And so some people say we can only solve one thing at a time, but we have to solve both. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, you know, right now, Europe is doing everything it can to get off Russian gas as quickly as possible. And Biden has promised in the short term, because they can't completely stop burning it immediately, the way the system is set up, that he will export massive amounts of LNG. So here's one simple thing we could do. How about the mind-boggling quantity of natural gas, also known as methane, that's being wasted by being flared and vented every year. It's 30, in the United States alone, 35 billion cubic meters are being thrown away, enough to power 17 million homes. How about capturing that? It, if we capture that and send it to Europe, it will fill, fulfill half of the pledge that Biden made to them, and we can do it according to the International Energy Agency. We can capture 75% um, of that at no net cost. So here's an opportunity to tackle both things at the same time. Catherine, do you have anything to add? Well, I just, we're so nonsensical, right? The fact is we're, we're wasting something that is actually valuable. And so we, I mean, look, I, I'm always hopeful that the market will bring some discipline and then folks will say, oil and gas companies will say, wait a minute, there's actually value to this, especially with prices being so high. Um, but as someone who's a regulator as well, I know you need to regulate um, because there are other reasons that you can go spend your money on digging more, more wells. So uh, I think that we need, we really need to be focused on this, but as Fred said, it's low hanging fruit. And by the way, when we're talking about getting to 1.5 degrees, every little bit helps. And you heard John Doerr talk about 0.4 degrees of warming. Think about that. We're trying to stay well below two degrees, striving for 1.5. 0.4 is a lot. Right, so then let's follow, to follow up on that point, uh, let's talk a bit about how we get there. And I'd be curious if you could give us a sense of the global picture uh, on methane regulation. Uh, well, I'd like to say Canada's a leader. Uh, we've committed to reduce methane emissions by 75%, and that's existing, that's new and existing. Um, but you've seen momentum, um, and John Kerry was really great working with the Europeans, bringing folks together with the new Global Methane Pledge. So more than 100 countries have committed to reducing methane emissions by 30%. I think we can be more ambitious, but you gotta start somewhere uh, by 2030. And so I think this is really important. There's also a Global Methane Hub, uh, which provides support to developing countries, and I think we need to be doing that. Obviously, we have a huge challenge. And by the way, we're only talking here, we often focus a lot on, on oil and gas, but I mean, there's a huge challenge when it comes to ag. Um, it's burping of cows, yes. Um, but there's, uh, I mean, I think that, that that's what we need to do. We need the world to get its act together, to stop delaying and act, work as quickly as possible, but also supporting folks and countries that may not have the technology or the expertise. And I know probably Fred's gonna talk about, but we have huge opportunities now with satellites. That, there's, that we've had a huge change in, uh, with um, new technologies that can make a real difference. Fred, what, what about the picture here in the U.S.? There's a lot on the table this year. Could you tell us, you know, with regard to methane regulation, what's on the table? What's the picture look like here? 
Sure. I think, you know, the Biden administration is taking the issue seriously because companies have made a lot of pledges, but frankly, we are not seeing evidence of these emissions, this methane pollution going down yet. So it is great, as Catherine said, that um, out of the White House and the State Department, they got 110 countries to agree to reduce methane emissions. Um, that's good. But as Catherine also said, we need regulations to make sure it happens. And so in the United States, last fall, the EPA, uh, Michael Regan, a former colleague of mine at EDF, is now head of the EPA, issued regulations on a million uh, wells in the United States, existing wells, to bring their methane pollution emissions down. What the regulations didn't cover, though, Justin, is the smaller, low-producing wells that are only 6% of the natural gas that we produce. But they emit 50% of the methane pollution. So we have to make that methane regulation at EPA stronger to cover these low producing wells because if you don't, you miss half or more than half of the methane pollution. And action's also happening at the state level. Just uh, within the last uh, month or so, the New, Mexican, uh, the New Mexico governor, um, Lujan Grisham, uh, issued preliminary approval for very strict rules that will um, also limit methane emissions. So things are happening at the state level. These federal re regulations are crucial. Well, I'm curious, both of you mentioned oil and gas. Fred, we were, I saw you at Sarah Week, the big oil and gas conference. And if you listen to what people are saying there, they're talking a lot about methane and they're saying that they're taking action and that they're uh, uh, you know, doing, uh, you know, uh, capturing the met their methane. So I'm just curious, how do you hold industry accountable? Uh, do you believe what you hear? Um, what are your thoughts? Well, whether it's the voluntary commitments or frankly the regulations that I've just talked about, you absolutely have to hold them accountable. And the good news is we're moving into a golden age of measurement, as John Doerr said uh, just a little while ago, with drones, with planes, and uh, as Catherine uh, said, with satellites. So uh, methane sat, uh, which, is being, which has been uh, almost completely constructed now by an affiliate of EDF, meth the methane sat company, um, that's gonna be launched on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Um, and once that goes up, it'll be the highest precision instrument to measure methane, and it'll be able to detect not only the big sources that existing satellites can detect, but also very small, diffuse sources where a lot of this pollution is coming from. And it's what, you know, President Reagan said back in the day, trust, but verify. And I believe that this accountability, this transparency, is going to be a big driver of progress going forward. Catherine, do you have anything to add about technology, the role that technology can play in uh, dealing with this issue? Well, I would just start with the trust. I mean, I think that trust but verify is uh, so important. Um, when I was minister and, and we were, re we'd regulated methane, I was like, okay, just let's just take the tech and just do it and then tell everyone, okay, you underestimated, and by the way, here it is, and go to work now. Um, and so I think that that is, it is really important um, that we hold people to account. Tomorrow I'm doing a session on net zero commitments uh, by non-state actors, so that's companies, businesses, cities, and that's relevant to this conversation as well. But I think that, the, that this new technology, I mean, that's the exciting thing, that we have really amazing new technology. And one of the companies, there's a Canadian company, GHG Sat, I am very Canadian, um, but it's uh, out there around the world um, detecting methane um, emissions, methane leaks, and it found one in Turkmenistan. And so if you actually want to know where a lot of the leaks are from oil and gas, Turkmenistan. It's very old infrastructure. But they were able to identify this leak, pass the information on um, to the U.S. Embassy there. There was no Canadian representative. And they, at that point, uh, were able to work with the government to get it shut down. That was the equivalent of taking a million cars off the road. Like, that's the opportunity right now. But once again, it's great to know how big the problem is. Um, and I'm actually scared, right? We're going to find out. It's a lot bigger. We have a lot more emissions than we thought. But then you really need to see the action, and that's always the challenge on climate. 
There's just a lot of talk. I think we've made good progress, but now we do not have time. And in methane, we especially don't have time, so we need to use this new tech. We need to get the emissions out there, and then folks need to be held responsible. And you know, they need to be provided in developing countries, as I said, with support to actually take the action. I just want to follow up on that. I mean, there's a lot uh, of known unknowns when it comes to methane. And you just, I mean, you alluded to one just now. And I guess I'd be curious to hear from you both if you have thoughts about what we might be learning, you know, in the next few years that, you know, we have a sense of what we're going to learn, but we don't know as this technology advances. Well, a um, couple thoughts come to mind. Uh, one, as the technology advances, people that are in places like Florida that are gonna be hurt the most need to lean in the most and lead. Uh, here in Florida, EDF has been lucky to partner with the Volo Foundation. They are leaning in and leading. And I think transparency, as people see what's gonna happen, is gonna inspire more action. Um, I ideally action in our country in a bipartisan way. The second thing is that as we learn more, uh, we're beginning to discover that some of the things that we may have thought were answers need to be thought about carefully. So let me just mention quickly, Justin, hydrogen. There's a big rush around the world to invest half a trillion or maybe a whole trillion in hydrogen infrastructure to do all sorts of things. But it turns out now that we know that hydrogen indirectly causes uh, global warming as well, when it leaks. And hydrogen is the smallest molecule. You know, it's the upper left hand of your atomic chart. It's the smallest atom, and you put two together, you have the smallest molecule. So it's what scientists call slippery. And um, what that means is companies that are now building this infrastructure need to measure hydrogen leaks so we don't make the same mistake we made with a natural gas infrastructure we make sure we only use it in places that aren't going to leak, probably not in the distributed uses like to power cars and trucks with thousands or tens of thousands of canisters of hydrogen around. And two, where we do use it, maybe in centralized location where the opportunities to leak are less, we measure and make sure that we're building it tight. And so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> They're like, you're done now, go <laughs> Well, okay, well, great. I, I, we have a, a few more minutes. I'm gonna ask just one maybe closing question. Um, you know, I opened by saying this is a big problem with big opportunities, and that's a good reason for this to, to close the session. But the other thing that comes to mind about methane is that it's an area where there's a lot of collaboration, perhaps an area to build bridges. Um, and, and I guess I would ask if you both have thoughts about that. Is this an area where we can really build some bridges and make some progress uh, that might not come in other places in climate? I'm always hopeful. Um, look, I mean, if we're just rational about this, this is low hanging fruit. Going back to what I said at the, the beginning, I mean, we need every degree or every you know, percentage of a degree so we can actually do what we need to ensure that we have a sustainable future for our kids, to ensure that Miami isn't underwater, to make sure the Arctic doesn't, uh, doesn't melt. Um, and so we have these opportunities. It's will we actually use them? Now on methane, I, I mean, I think one, look, it's, it's huge in terms of being able to, to take action really quickly. Uh, two, there's money to be made. Three, there's actual uh, technology that can help incent this. Four, there's global momentum, in, in including uh, and good momentum in the United States. But we just can't, we just have to act. And there has to be less talk and actually more discipline in seeing these outcomes. But I'm hopeful, and I, I think the, the reality is that you guys are all here. You could be anywhere else listening to us talk about methane. I mean, Fred and I could go on about methane probably forever. But that's important. And I think that we need to get people motivated and educated and so that we all are taking the scale, the action that's really at scale. This is action at scale. We can do it now. And it's hugely important. So in that sense, I feel optimistic. But uh, as we say in French, nosh pas, never give up. Nancy Pelosi, just go for it. And I think that's what we've got to do. By the way, she is so awesome. We got 
a second applause line, but it's for Nancy Pelosi. I know. So, well, well. Fred, did you want to have the last word on going Oh, forward? Nancy Pelosi deserves uh, at least that. Um, I, I just think uh, in the case of methane, it's um, really bad news in the sense that it's so potent and, and warming the planet so fast, um, especially in that first 10 or 20 years. And it's really good news in that when we cut the emissions from the oil and gas industry from dairy, uh, from landfills, from coal mines, those are the main sources, we can make a real dif difference in a hurry on the temperatures we otherwise see. And I think there is an opportunity here, Justin, to cooperate um, with oil and gas companies, with uh, farmers, uh, with municipalities running landfills to reduce these emissions dramatically. I agree with Catherine, the 30% target globally from all sources by 2030 is doable and, and, and I think we'll be able to do more. From the oil and gas sector, 45% by 2025 in the next two and a half years, I think we can do that and we need to do it. The time for talk is over now we need action. Great. Well, thank you. The time for talk is over. So <laughs> thank you, Fred. Yay! Thank you, Catherine. Fred. Thank you. Hey, let's go.